This story begins in 1989, when Yasumi Matsuno joined Japanese developer Quest Corporation working on various projects. In 1991, Matsuno, eager to make his mark in the company, pitched something uncommon in the Japanese game market at the time, a real-time tactical RPG for the Super Famicom. Matsuno served as the director and designer of the game. Quest's CEO Makoto Tokugawa served as the game's producer. The soundtrack was co-composed by Masaharu Iwata, Hayato Matsuo, and Hitoshi Sakimoto. Art was handled by Hiroshi Minagawa and Akihiko Yoshida, who also did design work on the game. Many of these Japanese people will be familiar to modern fans of tactical RPGs or Final Fantasy and will be recurring throughout this video. The game was meant to compete against Japan's RPG heavyweights at the time, Dragon Quest and Final Fantasy. To accomplish this, Matsuno decided to take a less conventional approach to the gameplay. He had never played a tactical game before, so on staff recommendation he played Nobunaga's ambition to get a feel for it. This game, which became known as Ogre Battle, was ambitiously created to be the fifth chapter chapter in a seven-chapter Ogre Battle saga. Matsuno wrote the story as a simplistic high fantasy battle between good and evil with a demonic enemy and little backstory. His biggest regret with Ogre Battle was what he believed to be an unrealistic tone he set with the setting of the game. The Super Famicom hardware made it challenging to create a 3D-like top-down display of the battlefield of the game. The angled perspective in battles was meant to contrast with the common top-down and first-person views popular with other games at the time. Ogre Battle, The March of the Black Queen, released in 1993 in Japan and was later localized for the West in 1995. Matsuno was a fan of the British band Queen, borrowing their song titles not only for the name of the game but also inspiring the Raihin Sea location within the game. Nintendo convinced Quest to double their originally planned 200,000 copy print run of the game before its release in Japan after seeing the positive press the game was receiving, and the game still sold through all stock. Only 25,000 units of the game were produced by their Western publisher Enix before the game's Western release in 1995, and those copies quickly sold out, leading to reorders on stock. The game was a critical success, receiving great reviews and fantastic word of mouth from people lucky enough to have been able to play the game. I was 13 years old at the time, and the game was selling brand new at EB Games, which we now know and love in the USA as GameStop, for the low, low price of like $96 brand new when I saw it at the store. The only Super Nintendo game I saw with a price like that brand new in the Super Nintendo's lifetime was Chrono Trigger. But while 14-year-old Isidore was a futurist genius when he decided Chrono Trigger was worth every dollar of his quarter of a year savings of allowance at the time, 13-year-old Isidore had to learn the value of quality and regret his decision in life by not paying $96 for Ogre Battle on the Super Nintendo. Fortunately, Atlas was a good publisher in the West who had an eye for games that hadn't reached their full sales potential and published the limited edition of Ogre Battle on the PlayStation in 1997. I was finally able to snag a copy of the game to play through it again. That said, I did borrow the Super Nintendo copy from my best friend whom I still talk to this day, and played it ravenously in all of my spare time. The story of Ogre Battle takes place on the continent of Zetagenia. It follows events 25 years after the Empress Endora conquers the continent and rules under a harsh fist with the aid of the sage Rashidi's dark magic. As for the gameplay itself, you begin Ogre Battle entering the name and gender of your character. The Prophet Warren asks you various questions, and your answers to those questions determine your character's initial stats and special attacks in the game. The gameplay loop is simple. You travel from stage to stage, liberating settlements and regions from the clutches of the evil Zetaginian Empire. In between each stage, you can set up your units for success from a variety of different characters you can recruit throughout your revolution. Setup would include determining the leader of your unit and placing units on the front or back row. The row determines which and how many attacks a unit would use, with some units excelling in the back row, others in the front row, and a few that could function equally well in the front or back. Players could also equip characters with treasures to increase their stats or use other items for smaller permanent boosts. It was also also possible to promote units to higher classes, and for some unit types there were multiple choices to promote a class to when it met the appropriate alignment and level requirements. In actual battles, players would deploy their units from base. To beat the stages, you would have to liberate the settlements where the bosses were by sending units to stop on the towns. The enemy commanders would also send units toward your base or any settlements you've liberated between your base and the commander's location. When your units met with enemy units, combat would take place automatically between those units. Right Although combat is automated, players could pause and 
doesn't set strategies to pick off specific units or attempt to make the enemy retreat by picking off the leaders. In addition to this, tarot cards earned from liberating places could be used in battle to more directly affect the outcomes in interesting ways, such as switching the enemy's front and back rank, making the enemies fight each other, or just dealing huge amounts of direct damage to all units. To complicate things, there was also a reputation stat that represented how good or evil the player was perceived to be by the people they were liberating, and alignment stats on all of the units for a similar purpose. Reputation could have an effect on special events that play out in stages, possible unique character recruits, and affect the ending of the game. Alignment had effects on which classes units could promote to, and also had effects on how the player's reputation would be affected if the unit liberated a town. In general, units' alignments would go up if they fought enemies at higher levels than they were, and it would go down if they fought enemies at lower levels. Players who wanted a good reputation would have to be careful to liberate settlements only with high alignment units. In addition to ordinary units, the game had many special units, or unique characters that could be recruited by the player in the course of a playthrough. These characters often had better stats than their ordinary counterparts and conferred stronger leader bonuses to their units. Also, some special units in the game required special items to class up and had some seriously unbalanced strengths. Like being a small unit that could attack an entire enemy party three times in one battle, or a unit that could be made leader to give every party member in its unit an additional attack. The battlefields in Ogre Battle also contained lots of buried treasures to find with powerful items and numerous hidden cities or temples to liberate, which meant it could be very easy to miss important things you wouldn't be able to easily go back to unless you made multiple saves. There were also a few points in the game where players had a choice of which stages to do first, or they could completely skip some of the optional stages, but these stages usually had nice rewards. While its Great Atlas made Ogre Battle more accessible with the PlayStation release, the Super Nintendo version was superior due to its cartridge format with non-existent or at least unnoticeable loading times. I think the most recent Western release of Ogre Battle was on the Wii's Virtual Console in 2009, but apparently a Sega Saturn version of the game exists in Japan with limited voice acting too. If these are beyond your means of obtaining and playing the game, emulation is always available if that doesn't offend you. Ogre Battle was an amazing game. There was nothing like it on the market at the time, and there wouldn't be much like it for a long time either. The game wasn't without flaws though, especially when it came to game balance. Some special classes made the game way too easy. Also, you could abuse the fact that stages had no time limit to just farm money. In later stages, enemy units seemed to never stop spawning, so it was also easy to farm experience and manipulate the alignment on your units. My biggest criticism of Ogre Battle was the time commitment required to thoroughly explore a lot of the stages past the mid-game. A single stage could take hours to complete if you're thorough, and it's easy to miss ending affecting events if you play through the game without a guide. Since the combat is automated and unskippable, the gameplay could get repetitive and kind of boring eventually when your characters are just so strong you don't even really need to think that much anymore to get to the end of the game. Like Matsuno stated regret for, the story was more or less an unblurred line of good versus evil. I'd still say the game had a more memorable story than any other tactical RPG available in the West at the time. There was a weight of history behind the events that play out too. The game's multiple endings were numerous and sometimes very different, but given how long even one playthrough of Ogre Battle was and the lack of modern quality of life elements to shorten subsequent playthroughs, many players probably never even got to see more than one or two endings. Some of the game's audio tracks and even several playable characters make cameos in Matsuno's future titles too, like Canopus, fan favorite Deneb, Lands, and Tristan Zenobia. I was 13 years old the first time I played Ogre Battle, and I can confidently say it was the one game that cultivated my current love for tactical RPGs. The other thing I can definitely say here in 2024 is that Yasumi Matsuno's video game storytelling ability has improved greatly since his work on Ogre Battle. But if Ogre Battle is episode 5, what about episodes 1 through 4, 6, and 7? In 1995, the Ogre Battle team at Quest, led by Yasumi Matsuno, released Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together on the Super Famicom. This game was later ported to the PlayStation in 1997, and this is the version we got in the West from Atlas in the year 2000 under the title Tactics Ogre. Matsuno was heavily inspired by political conflicts in Europe and Asia in the development of the game's story, as opposed to a lot of the more fantasy-themed elements in Ogre Battle. Tactics Ogre is a complex, dark fantasy political tale focusing less on supernatural elements. He based the world's history on the Middle Ages and its population and society on the Roman Empire. Seeing the positive reception from people of Final Fantasy's more complex stories, Matsuno created his own. Write it out.
He used the first story split of the game in his pitch, illustrating the story's complexities and the effect players' choices could have on the gameplay. Instead of Ogre Battle's simpler good versus evil story, Tactics Ogre skirts the gray line, questioning the meaning of justice and why people fight. The story, system, and tutorial text for the game totaled 300,000 characters for which memory on the Super Famicom cartridge was set aside for. Matsuno had to stage the story scenes like a play due to the limitations of the console. Real-life conflicts like territorial clashes in Syria Azerbaijan and Armenia, the Yugoslav War, and the Rwandan genocide influenced the narrative. But rather than focus on ethnicity, Matsuno wrote the scenario to show how a conflict between groups could be resolved. Visual novels and game books inspired him to create multiple story routes in the game. The characters Denam and his friend Vice were named as such due to how Denim and Levi's were clothing brands and materials inspired by the lower class. This was also meant to show how Denim and Vice were from the lower class. The female lead, Kachua, was given a name more fitting her higher class. Most most interestingly though is that Matsuno designed Kachua to be emotionally unstable and obsessed with Denim, to contrast with the majority of female fantasy heroines at the time. Important Zenobian characters from Ogre Battle like Warren and Canopus, among others, made appearances in the game too in order to help familiarize players of Ogre Battle with the new systems in Tactics Ogre. Similar to Ogre Battle, players could change Denim's name, input a birthday, and answer a series of questions to get a unique alignment and stat spread at the beginning of the game. Players would travel between nodes on a world map to trigger story events and battles. Each movement to a new node would take up one day of time, and could also change weather conditions. Weather conditions could affect how characters moved and acted in battle. Between battles, players could equip their characters with weapons, armor, and accessories. They could also go into a training mode to have their own units fight each other to level up. In the Super Famicom version of the game, this training mode could be played multiplayer too. The battlefields took on an overhead quarter view perspective inspired by the game Solstice. Tactics Ogre switched up the gameplay from real time to turn based tactics. The the battle system was inspired by chess. Players could deploy up to 10 units on the battlefield out of a pool of up to 30 units total. According to class and equipment, characters had set movement squares. Attack ranges varied according to their weapons. Tarot cards dropped by defeated foes could be picked up for temporary stat bonuses. Units' weight, agility, and actions taken would determine how often they could get turns in battle. Battles would end when the victory conditions were met or the game would end if Denim is killed or the victory condition becomes impossible to clear. In addition to moving and using weapons, there are also options to use items or magic. Denim also had a special option to attempt to persuade enemies to join his army. Units would behave according to their alignment, and they also had elements that could make them more or less effective against characters of opposing elements in battle. Like Ogre Battle, Tactics Ogre also has character classes with dedicated abilities. Branching story paths resulting from decisions the player makes at the end of the initial chapters of the game follow the paths of Chaos, Neutral, and Law. Up to eight different ending variations can occur according to the player's choice and the Warren Report can be read to get a record of all the storyline events that occur on a playthrough. If Ogre Battle was an amazing game, Tactics Ogre was an awesome game, made even more awesome with its subsequent remakes. Speaking honestly though, the PlayStation port of Tactics Ogre that the West got in the year 2000 was rough around the edges from a technical standpoint, and like Ogre Battle's PlayStation version, the game had loading screens too. Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together, remade for the PSP in the West in 2011 however, is still one of the best tactical RPGs I've ever played. And the modern remake Tactics Ogre Reborn, released on the Switch, PS4, PS5, and Steam is just as good. The PSP version of Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together added a Wheel of Fortune feature and plenty of fun post-game features that more than doubled the playtime of the original game. Wheel of Fortune let players New Game Plus onto different parts of the timeline they first completed the game on so they could experience all of the different branching paths of the story on one play file. Changes were also made to the gameplay. Players could now forge weapons. Party size was increased and new recruitable characters were added. A chariot system was added to allow players to rewind time to potentially fix mistakes they made in battle. The script was expanded to over 700,000 characters exceeding even Final Fantasy XII. Tactics Ogre Reborn is just as good, but doesn't completely replace the PSP version of the game. Instead, it changed features to rebalance the game and respect players' time more. Big changes toward this were made by reducing the monotony of equipment forging and returning the training feature from the original Super Famicom version of the game to make it much easier to keep units' levels up between battles. However, to make up for how easy it was to level up, the developers also implemented a hard limit on how high units' levels could go at certain points in the game, making the game more challenging on the harder difficulties, since grinding was no 
longer an option once you hit the level cap. These changes had mixed reception among fans of the series, as some people enjoyed being able to spend their personal time to grossly overpower their characters through careful micromanagement with class changes in the PSP version of the game, while other players appreciated the more balanced tactical gameplay in Reborn. Personally, I love how much time Reborn saves me in not having to grind and I appreciate the additional challenge of the game on its hard difficulty, but I also love how ridiculously strong you can make Giver units in the PSP version of the game too. Still, I'd recommend playing Reborn if you want to play a Tactics Ogre game, purely because I think the game is a lot more respectful of players' time, and I think the new features they've added will be better received by most gamers new to the series here in 2024. It's also a much easier game to obtain given its availability on Steam, Switch, PlayStation 4, and PlayStation 5. If emulation doesn't offend you, the original Super Famicom version of the Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together does have a fan translation. Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together is the seventh episode of the Ogre Battle Saga, and takes place in the Kingdom of Valeria. The events of Episode 7 occur parallel to the events of Episode 6. The protagonist, Denim Pavel, takes part in a resistance force against occupying powers. He ends up being caught in the ethnic conflicts driving the war, and events carry on from there. The story complexity of Tactics Ogre was far and beyond most video games at the time, made even more complex by the branching storylines. Even by today's strict and often divisive opinions on what makes a story good in a video game, I think most people would agree that Matsuno really outdid himself with the story to Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together. It's definitely the best story I've seen in a tactical RPG, and I think its branching paths give it an edge even over its amazing narrative work on Final Fantasy Tactics. I think the moments between Lancelot Hamilton and Lancelot Tartarus, as well as the potentially shocking moments between Denim, Vice, and Catua near the end of the game are its strongest, most memorable scenes. From a narrative design perspective, Catua is one of my favorite female characters in a video game. Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together sold over a half a million units in Japan when it was released on the Super Famicom in 1995. While the West waited five years until Atlas finally ported the PlayStation version, the Super Famicom version was still widely praised as being one of the best Japanese video game imports of the late 90s. Given how great Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together was in 1995, it's no surprise Squaresoft welcomed Asmi Matsuno with open arms into its company when he left Quest after its production. With him came Ogre Battle veterans Hidoshi Minagawa, Akihiko Yoshida, Hitoshi Sakimoto, and Masaharu Iwata. Development immediately began on Final Fantasy Tactics, with Final Fantasy series producer Hironobu Sakaguchi producing the game. Matsuno created a brand new world called Ivalice for Final Fantasy Tactics, a world which would be developed in his later games and creative collaborations with Square in the future as part of the Ivalice Alliance. Matsuno's goal in the creation of Final Fantasy Tactics was to create an accessible tactical game with a storyline focusing on class-based conflict and the rewriting of history. What he was doing narratively was something that was never before seen in a Final Fantasy title up to that point. Final Fantasy Tactics gameplay shared many aspects with Tactics Ogre in its grid-based combat, but this game's secret sauce was in its job system, which added a completely new dimension to character development with job skills and job points to level up classes to obtain these skills. These classes were mostly based on well-established archetypes within the Final Fantasy universe, like White Mages, Black Mages, Summoners, and the like. In addition to their main class, characters could also equip a subclass and equip reactionary, support, and movement skills from any class. This gave each character the potential to be very different from even other characters in the same job class. Like Tactics Ogre, players could recruit generic units or unique units throughout the course of the game's story, and unique units also came with their own unique job classes as well. The game's other secret sauce, of course, were the Final Fantasy aspects of the game, like the chocobos and the summons to draw in the Final Fantasy crowd. Despite the game's very Final Fantasy code of paint and high production value, it was still very much a Yasumi Matsuno game. He placed a heavier emphasis on individual character growth, like the flagship Final Fantasy series did it, but he kept the chess-based gameplay style he developed in Tactics Ogre. Levels were designed in a compact diorama style to maintain 60 frames per second, and the scale of battles was also smaller to reflect the more personal nature of the game's conflicts. Matsuno's narrative strayed significantly from Sakaguchi's original design concept. He turned the story into a Final Fantasy-themed morality tale, wishing to to create a story of swashbuckling heroism. Matsuno took inspiration from the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the story of the Name of the Rose in the creation of a long-suppressed historical account, and he took inspiration from his own experience witnessing the hierarchy in game development of how senior designers were treated like royalty in creating the game's themes of class-based society. This was all packed into a brand new canvas of a world for future games called Ivalice. Hitoshi Sakimoto describes his music for the game as bright and cheerful, conveying themes of hope and love. Matsuno and established Final Fantasy composer Nobuo Uematsu urged him not to worry about keeping the style of the Final Fantasy series in the production of the game's music. Final Fantasy Tactics tells a story
story that was supposed to be covered up by the church about Ramza Bale. Ramza is a noble who becomes involved in a succession conflict known as the Lion War between representatives of Princess Ophelia and Prince Orinus after the death of the king. Hot off the heels of Final Fantasy VII several months prior, which was an absolute landfall game for the overall health of the Final Fantasy series, Final Fantasy Tactics sold like gangbusters, to the tune of 1.2 million units in Japan and 2.4 million units in the West. These are the kinds of numbers I don't think the tactical RPG genre had seen until many years later with the resurgence of the Fire Emblem series on the 3DS and Switch. Final Fantasy Tactics is considered by some to be one of the best video games ever made. I personally think Tactics Ogre is the superior experience due to its branching storylines and wealth of post-game content, but I do think Final Fantasy Tactics is the best direct Final Fantasy spin-off I've ever played, and its story measures up just as well as Tactics Ogre's. Out of every game Yasumi Matsuno has ever been responsible for, this is probably his most famous, even if Final Final Fantasy XII sold more units. With that in mind, it's no wonder people freaked out when the NVIDIA leaks revealed Square Enix was working on a remake of Final Fantasy Tactics several years ago. Only time will tell if we actually see it, but given how just about every game on that leaked document came to be, including Shin Megami Tensei V most recently, I would not be surprised to see it. Since the game's most recent release is stuck on 17-year-old hardware as of the release of this video, emulation would be your best bet to actually play the game if that doesn't offend you. Going back in time, a bit to just before Yasumi Matsuno left Quest for Squaresoft, he had begun work on developing the third game in the Ogre Battle saga. Matsuno only laid the foundation for the game, as he dished Quest to work at Squaresoft to develop Final Fantasy Tactics. But Episode 6 of the Ogre Battle saga was developed and released by Quest in 1999 in Japan and the year 2000 in the West. This game was called Ogre Battle 64, and it inherited many gameplay aspects of the original Ogre Battle, including its aesthetic style and music. Music was composed by the same team who did Ogre Ogre Battle. While the game's aesthetics were similar, Akihiko Yoshida, who is now working at Microsoft, was replaced by Toshinaga Kato for the character designs. Unlike the first Ogre Battle title in which characters moved one after the other, this game featured semi-real-time combat with multiple characters taking action at the same time in battle. Ogre Battle 64, Episode 6 of the Ogre Battle Saga, tells the story of Magnus Gallant, a recent military academy graduate who becomes involved in a civil war as a rebel commander. Despite Nintendo publishing the game in Japan, it didn't reach big sales numbers, but the marketing for the game was impressive. It received six guidebooks explaining levels and mechanics, an art book, comic anthologies, and even a novelization in Japan. Atlas USA published the game in the West, and it launched to extremely favorable review scores, even if it did get low sales. As one of the people lucky enough to play this game on release, I can say it definitely made me feel better about buying a Nintendo 64, as it was a very good game. Most people who owned a Nintendo 64 were gushing about Super Mario 64, The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time, Majora's Mask, or GoldenEye 007 and had no interest in strategy RPGs, so the low sales numbers were no surprise. Its sales suffered for being on the Nintendo 64, which was known mostly for its broad appeal family games, than for mature strategy RPGs. Ogre Battle 64 is popularly known as a great game nobody played for that reason. In 2024, the most recent releases of Ogre Battle 64 have been on the now defunct Wii U Virtual Console and the Wii Virtual Console. Other than that, if Nintendo 64 gaming is out of your reach and you can't find a physical copy of the game, there is always emulation if that doesn't offend you. While Quest was working on Ogre Battle 64, Yasumi Matsuno's dream team, hot off the explosive success of Final Fantasy Tactics, created yet another game many people of the time called one of the greatest games ever made, Vagrant Story. While this game isn't a typical standout action RPG, rather than a tactical RPG, it is a part of Matsuno's Ivalice world, which is why I mention it here briefly. Vagrant Story tells the story of Ashley Riot, an elite agent investigating the ruined city of Leomonde. Vagrant Story also released to fantastic review scores. I loved Vagrant Story when it came out in the year 2000, but the game has aged like milk, both visually and from a user experience standpoint, which is what keeps me from gushing about it here in 2024 or recommending anyone actually play it. The game is prime remake material though, if they could get Dasmi Matsuno back on board. If you really want to play the game, the original Sony PlayStation is your only option unless emulation doesn't offend you. Quest went on to develop The Legend of Ogre Battle Gaiden, Prince of Zenobia, for the Neo Geo Pocket Color in Japanese in 2000. This game is a side story to the original Ogre Battle with similar gameplay mechanics. It does have new maps, classes, and story though. Unfortunately, the game was never officially localized into English. However, a fan translation was made in 2019 for anybody who is not offended by emulation and wants to play it. In 2001, Quest also developed Tactics Ogre, The Knight of Lotus, on the Game Boy Advance. It was released in the West in 2002 by Atlas and published by Nintendo in Japan. This game is a side story taking place before episode 5 of the 
Ogre Battle Saga, or the first Ogre Battle game. It follows the gameplay style of the original Tactics Ogre game. Characters are unique with intelligence, strength, and agility stats. They also are assigned an element of either chaotic, lawful, or neutral. Characters could earn emblems for performing feats in battle, which could confer stats, have negative effects, or be required to change classes. The protagonist Alphonse Loher is a knight in Lotus' Order of the Sacred Flame and is sent to Ovis, which is brutally oppressed by Lotus. He learns the truth about what happens in Ovis from locals, which leads him to question his own alliances. The game has five different endings, but the ones fans of Tactics Ogre want to see is the A or A plus ending, which tie into the original Tactics Ogre game in one of the most awesome ways possible. Hitoshi Sakimoto and Masaharu Iwata returned for work on the soundtrack. While Yasumi Matsuno wasn't heavily involved in this game's development, it was still well received and scored well from reviewers, just not as well as other games in the Ogre Battle saga. I thought it was a fun game that fit the series, and I love the tie-in ending to the original Tactics Ogre. I think it's a game definitely made for fans of Tactics Ogre. Tactics Ogre The Knight of Lotus is another game stuck on two decades old Game Boy Advance hardware. But if emulation doesn't offend you, that's always an option. After Tactics Ogre The Knight of Lotus was released, Quest left game development and was bought out by Square, bringing the Ogre Battle Saga IP into Squaresoft hands. Former members of Quest worked with Matsuno at Squaresoft to develop Final Fantasy Tactics Advance on the Game Boy Advance, which released in 2003. Hitoshi Sakimoto was back as the primary composer for the game, with assistance from Nobuo Uematsu, Kaori Okishi, and Ayako Sasso. Akihiko Yoshida was involved in the art, and Matsuno actually took on the role of producer for the game instead of director. Final Fantasy Tactics Advance has five different races of characters with their own set of classes, Moogles, Banga, Viera, Numo, and Humans. The job system let characters learn abilities off their equipment when they reach high enough AP from doing battles. Mastering abilities opens up new class options for characters. The game also introduced the law system to the series, in which a judge would make rules players would need to follow in battle to avoid penalties. In addition, judges would have recommended actions that reward characters with judge points they could use to do combo attacks or summon a guardian beast. Other than that, the game looks and plays very similar to Final Fantasy Tactics. As for the story, March Raduju is the main character, a new student and resident of St. Ivalice and its school. When his friend Mute brings an old tome to his house and they read the foreign words, the kids awaken in a fantasy Ivalice that is a reincarnation of Mute's memories from a Final Fantasy game. Square published the game in Japan and Nintendo published the game in the West. It sold over a million copies in the West alone, with 440,000 copies sold in Japan in its first year. It was a very well-received game, but personally, I liked the original Final Fantasy Tactics a lot more. The judge and law system soured the gameplay experience for me, and while the game definitely wasn't for little kids, it did tone back a lot on the dark fantasy vibe I loved in Matsuno's older games. Yasumi Matsuno went on to create the original concept and plot for Final Fantasy XII in the world of Ivalice, which also featured races of characters created for Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. But when part of the Final Fantasy XII team left Square Enix to join Hironobu Sakaguchi's new company, Mistwalker, he reportedly became temperamental and refused to come into work for a month. The official word was that he stepped down from the project due to prolonged illness and directors Hiroshi Minagawa and Hiroyuki Ito finished the game. It was actually around this time that Hitoshi Sakimoto formed the music production company Bass Escape with Masaharu Iwata and Manabu Manamiki. Final Fantasy XII did what Final Fantasy does because Final Fantasy, and it sold like a bazillion copies, releasing to rave reviews in 2006. Matsuno ended up writing for Platinum Games' new violent action game Mad World, with the encouragement of his friend Atsushi Inaba. I've actually played all the way through Mad World in its time on the Wii, and I can't show footage of the game on my channel because it's just too violent, but I will say I would have never guessed Matsuno did the writing for this game based on all the complex stories he'd written for every other game he's made in the past. Square Enix created an updated port of Final Fantasy Tactics in 2007 for the PSP called Final Fantasy Tactics War of the Lions. The game updated the script to tie into other Ivalice Alliance games and created some new job classes. Full motion video cutscenes were also added to the game along with full voice acting for the North American localization. Multiplayer features were also added to the game. The game reviewed and sold well but was criticized for slowdown in battle and an uneven difficulty curve. Final Fantasy Tactics A2 Grimoire of the Rift was released in Japan in 2007 and the West in 2008 on the Nintendo DS, and was the first new game in the Final Fantasy Tactics series made without Yasumi Matsuno. Akihiko Yoshida was back for the logo art, and Hitoshi Sakimoto was back for the music too. The law system returned from the first Tactics Advance game. There are 50 classes called jobs in the game divided among the seven races. The grid-based combat returns with characters' turn order determined by agility. Whereas the first Tactics Advance game took place in a fantasy Ivalice, this game takes place in the real Ivalice shortly after the events of Final Fantasy XII. The protagonist, Luso Clemens, is drawn into the world of Ivalice in the middle
middle of a battle after writing his name in a half-empty book he finds while serving detention in the school's library. Final Fantasy Tactics A2 sold 670,000 units worldwide as of 2009. It didn't review as well as the other games, but it very much felt like a more beautiful extension of the first Tactics Advance game on two screens. Again, I just didn't like the law and judge systems myself. While the gameplay depth was there, it didn't really stand out among other games in the genre for me. As far as tactical RPGs on the Nintendo DS go, Atlas's Megami Tensei flavored Devil Survivor series was the new golden standard for me. Releasing in 2010 in Japan and 2011 in the West, Yasumi Matsuno returned to Square Enix to work on a remake of the original Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together that he made at Quest many years ago. And I already talked about that legendary game. I will also add that it was definitely one of the best reasons to own a Sony PSP. Yasumi Matsuno became involved in 2013 with Playdeck's Kickstarter project to produce Unsung Story, but that was a disaster with its story already sung by many people on YouTube, so I won't go into further details. In 2016, Yasumi Matsuno went on to form his own game production company, Algebra Factory, which worked with Square Enix to produce Final Fantasy XIV's Stormblood expansion and the Save the Queen Blades of Gunhilder storyline for the Shadowbringers expansion. He also worked with Psy Games Corporation for game drafts and management for the game Lost Order. Yasumi Matsuno's most recent work as of the time I'm releasing this video was on the newest remake of Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together called Tactics Ogre Reborn, which released worldwide at the end of 2022. Looking back at Yasumi Matsuno's incredible career here in 2024, it's easy to see how he and the Ogre Battle team influenced so many games, even outside his legendary tactical RPGs and future games in the Final Fantasy series. So few developers have produced as many titles that have been heralded as best game ever made candidates as Yasumi Matsuno, and he forged an incredible team of talent that's still a part of influencing and creating fantastic games today, like artist Akihiko Yoshida, who went on to design characters like 2B in Nier Automata and the main characters in Bravely Default, and Hitoshi Sakimoto, who went on to form game music company Bass Escape with a team of musicians. For me, Tactics Ogre Let Us Cling Together and Tactics Ogre Reborn are his magnum opuses, but it's like choosing a diamond out of a pile of diamonds when it comes to his games. While those are my personal favorites, I'd still recommend Final Fantasy Tactics as an entry-level Matsuno title to most more casual gamers interested in playing one of his games. Final Fantasy Tactics is very accessible to casual audiences, but it lacks the branching story paths and volume that Tactics Ogre offers in its post-game. Final Fantasy Tactics still has the most awesome Sid in any Final Fantasy game too. The dude is literally called a thunder god in the game. Final Fantasy 16 has a mature dark fantasy story with a similar vibe to Matsuno's writing for the Final Fantasy Tactics and Tactics Ogre games. Coincidentally, a lot of Final Fantasy 16's development team actually worked on the Ivalice Alliance games too, like art director Hiroshi Minagawa, whose career was basically launched with the success of Ogre Battle in the 90s. Yoshi P, the game's producer, worked directly with Matsuno on parts of Final Fantasy XIV too. Matsuno had little to no direct involvement in Ogre Battle 64, Tactics Ogre The Night of Lotus, and Final Fantasy Tactics A2, but his fundamental gameplay mechanics and storytelling framework lived on in those games. Team Asano's triangle strategy game from Square Enix in 2022 definitely took some inspiration from Tactics Ogre with its branching political story paths and multiple endings as well as its style of gameplay. As recent as a week ago, VanillaWare's tactical RPG Unicorn Overlord released what features very similar to two of Matsuno's games, Ogre Battle and Final Fantasy XII. And of course, Base Escape did the soundtrack to that game too, so it even sounds like a Yasumi Matsuno game, even if Yasumi Matsuno had no involvement in the game. One thing I can say, after one or two hours of Unicorn Overlord completing everything is that as awesome as the game is, and to me that game is awesome enough to be a game of the year here in 2024, its story still doesn't compare to Yasumi Matsuno's best works. And while Final Fantasy XII is always going to be mainstream and relevant enough for people to get the reference, I imagine a lot of fans of Unicorn Overlord will be curious about Ogre Battle and Ogre Battle 64 if they're ever curious about other similar games. Unicorn Overlord almost feels like it was destined to happen given all the years Atlas had published the Ogre Battle Saga games in the West, but the game really makes me realize how special Yasumi Matsuno has been to the tactical RPG genre. Nintendo even published many of his earlier Ogre Battle Saga games in Japan, even though they had the competing Fire Emblem games under their umbrella. If I had to say what makes his game so special compared to other similar games, it would definitely be the stories he writes. But more than his amazing stories, he's also a great game designer. Very few game directors are both excellent storytellers and excellent game designers. Who knows, maybe someday soon we'll see a brand new Final Fantasy Tactics game, a remake of Vagrant Story, or games for episodes 1 through 4 of the Ogre Battle Saga. Better yet, maybe we'll see brand new IP for a tactical RPG directed by Yasumi Matsuno and his Ogre Battle team again. But even if we 
never see a new tactical RPG from Yasumi Matsuno ever again. His influence on the genre will always be remembered. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.